What is up, folks? Welcome back to my breakdown of season two of The Bear. This is episode eight. It's called Bolognese. Dining room. Dining room's coming along. Speaking of coming along, we are getting closer to 100,000 subscribers. If you've been enjoying hanging out on the channel and watching these breakdown videos that I make for you folks, I'd really appreciate a subscribe and a like on this video so more folks can find out about this channel. They actually made a window. For those that don't remember, in season one, we talked about there being a window for sandwiches in the new restaurant, and it actually happened. Thank you, sir. But that's why they surround themselves with bad motherfuckers who take care of them, push their ass. It's important. She said drive through now. Yeah, well, they wanted to sell OG through here, but they're having a really hard time hiring. You actually will see that at certain restaurants where they take either maybe one or a few select menu items or they change the type of service or they change even the opening hours and they offer it to usually a wider scale of folks. And the strategy there has multiple components because the restaurant, the you know four walls that the restaurant is inside of, that is what it is. It's kind of set in stone. Based on this restaurant, the concept that is the bear in this show, it is most likely a dinner only restaurant and Carmen and Sydney know that. They might have plans in the future to do lunch service or offer the tasting menu at lunchtime. There are tons of restaurants that do the full tasting menu at lunch. It's actually kind of a going out to eat hack, especially if you go to like a big well-known eating out city like Paris. You can sometimes go and have a really phenomenal deal at a restaurant that has like three Michelin stars, but you eat lunch there. You're getting the same dining room, the same wine, the same serviceware, the same cutlery, the same ingredients prepared by sometimes the same culinary team. And you can do it for cheaper because the dinner seats come at a little bit more of a premium and restaurants know that too. And so you have the physical real estate constraints. You also have the staffing constraints. You don't want to actually staff up a ton ton of extra people just to run service for another increased four hour chunk of the day. And so I remember when I was a manager and I was involved with creating the new like lunch slash brunch menu, we had to make sure that it was able to be run with just two people running the line when our dinner service had, I think, five people running the line. And so you hear that in this scene where Tina's saying they need one person to be able to run the window because most likely all the other chefs are going to be able to be prepping for service during that time. The restaurant's still able to bring in revenue. And it's not to say that like if Ibram really gets busy, someone will probably get pulled off their prep to like jump in and push help him through a push but for the most part we want to structure this like additional revenue stream in a way where only one person is able to control it by themselves and I think the other reason that chefs sometimes try to prioritize this is because it's often felt that if you're just doing tasting menu you limit the number of seats that you have on like your main thing which for the bear restaurant is like their main menu for dinner it's like you want to democratize things a little more you want to be able to like have things at a different price point to be able to have guests come in and enjoy what it is that you do to get in the space to interact with you and your product and your team. And so making a more accessible version of this via the window and sandwiches is just a really cool thing that you see across other restaurants too. I get it. Eleven Madison, dickhead. <laughs> All right. I told you it was trying to replicate Eleven Madison Park. I told you. And this is such a satisfying moment because Carmen gets to shit talk Richie for having worked in fine dining now. It's awesome. Permits have happened. Ticking down the days. Small detail, I don't know if this warrants an explanation, but there are ingredients on a speed rack behind Carmen in this scene. And aside from the fact that like they perfectly color coordinated them, I thought that was kind of cool, number one. Number two, they have like, it's, it's, it's citrus, it is quince, it's mangoes, it's apples, and those are on trays. And you might ask yourself, why aren't those maybe in the fridge? Why are they on this rack that like rolls around? One, certain fruits, when you put them in the fridge, they ultimately end up getting mealy. And so you want to keep those out of the fridge. Secondly, certain fruits ripen faster when they are kept out of the fridge and they're kept at room temperature and so that can also help with if you get a purveyor giving you something and like you need it for service tomorrow or over for over the weekend you might actually want to expedite that process by putting it on a sheet tray at room temperature and because those need to sit out and they might need to move around and especially for someone like Marcus on pastry if you want to have your ingredients close by it does help to be able to keep them on a speed rack and speed racks are because they're mobile and are often cheaper than metro rack setups that are holding maybe dry storage things that are a little bit more fixed and they're like up against a wall and that's where things live versus a speed rack where like you want to be able to kind of like change things out and you know if this needs to move or if I need the tray I can consolidate things as we start to use these fruits and lastly arguably the most important piece is the fact that you don't want to store fruits especially ripening ones in a way that they are stacked upon each other or they're buried or they're the, there's a bunch of weight pressing down on them anybody who's ever dealt with like apples or lemons where you dig down into the case and you find like the smashed or moldy lemon that ultimately ends up obviously like spread 
spreading to other lemons is also just not great to be storing your food with moldy food. But this is kind of like the most condensed and practical way to store this stuff in a way where you can also see everything at a bird's eye. You're not going to have that like gnarly lemon at the bottom of the case because you can see everything in one even layer. And this goes across the year. You have citrus in the wintertime going into the spring. Then you have in the spring and summer, you have stone fruit. And then in the fall, you have apples. And so certain kitchens, because they know that, will often keep a speed rack that is sometimes dedicated just to fruit. I guess the thing I'm most frustrated about, and this kind of brings it all the way back to my episode two video, is the fact that like they don't show how what Tina learned is actually helping her in this context. And it sucks because so many other characters had transformations in this season. And it's like Carmen has the like shedding of his ego and like opening it up his, you know, family background and kind of being more open to including that into his execution. You have Marcus going overseas and learning from like a really well acclaimed pastry chef and bringing that and crushing it in the kitchen. You have Richie obviously doing his stage last episode. You have Sydney going and doing her eating tour, connecting with other professionals in the city, reading that book about sports and coaching and ultimately helping her with that. And Tina, I don't know, maybe I'm just like missing the point or like my bias is like a little bit too heavy on this episode, but it's like she went to culinary school and it's like she kept her values that she already entered the experience with. She just like felt bad for Ibram the whole time. And I read that as unfortunately just another vote in the column of like why you shouldn't maybe go to culinary school, especially if you're someone like Tina who has already some industry experience and arguably years of industry experience and you're not starting from ground zero, you don't want a generalized education. And so that's ultimately where my frustrations come from. And these are things that I tried to keep in mind as I was creating my culinary program. You can check it out in the description if you're interested. If I'm way off base, please let me know in the comments. But I just, I don't, I didn't see the same transformation in Tina this season. <laughs> I feel like these scenes with Marcus and the tape, I had one in season one, but like it's xanthan gum. With an N at the end. I always told myself, because sometimes the way that people say it, it sounds like xanthan gum, but I always told myself xanthan gum only has one M in it. And that would always help me in my mind of saying, yeah, the gum, G-U-M, has the M. That's where the M is. There's no M in xanthan. It is a N at the end. Two thumbs up for Marcus as he's using square delis to put together his pantry or his dry storage, whatever you want to call it. For those that don't know, xanthan gum, with an N, is a hydrocolloid, and it's often used as like a stabilizer or in preparations where you want to thicken something. Fun quality or fact, I guess, if you want to talk about one of the reasons that chefs like using xanthan gum so much and one of the practical implications of this product is the fact that for the temperature range that most of us are used to working in, and that's like from fridge temperature all the way up to boiling, xanthan gum will thicken and help stabilize something regardless of what temperature you're incorporating it at. There are other hydrocolloids and these like white powders that chefs use, especially in like modernist cuisine settings that require heating to get the hydration to happen. Xanthan gum is incredibly used are friendly in that, again, across a lot of those practical temperature ranges that we're working in, the hydration can still happen. Bonus points if you're the type of person that after you use xanthan gum on something and you have a couple of air bubbles in it, you do the step to like put that thing inside of a vacuum chamber sealer because when you compress all that air out, you ultimately remove all those air bubbles, you still keep the thickening qualities, and it results in a really, really cool product that can have so many versatile applications. Got it. You wearing a suit? I wanted to call this out because this also is a fun juxtaposition between like where the office started and then where the office is now. And we're seeing a lot of those kind of like nods across this entire episode, specifically on the bookshelf, being able to look at like the bookshelf in one of the first episodes, like had the books. Yes, but there was like boxes of papers and unnecessary documents and just like clutter all over the place. And this is like a chef's office that you do want to spend time in, that you're excited to go into and get your work done or write a new menu or get on the phone with a purveyor or just and to just walk over and pull down your Anna Rose cookbook or your Culinaria Spain book or your SPQR book as you're coming up with a new pasta dish maybe and you're just going to like be inspired by walking into your like chef's office that still has nods to like the Fenway Park picture and stuff like that but like I love the way that they've updated this. I don't know if anybody else also shares this sentiment but like why is there always that one book that is like misshapen and doesn't actually fit the way that you want it to fit on your cookbook shelf? I have the same problem with like my Alinea book right here on this shelf is like I would love to stand it up in a way where it would align with all the other books on the shelf, but like Grant Ackett's just had to pick a weird aspect ratio for him to print out his book on. The other problem book for me, I think, is the El Celler de Can Roca book because it's just so tall. In previous videos, I left the link to the person who actually did the like investigative detective work to find out what all these books were and where to buy them, even for some of the really hard to, to find ones. And I'm going to link that below in the description too. Show you something. Um, 
I was thinking about the uh, the, the grapes and the bone broth, right? Okay. Um, Wait. What is this? Are we... You'll see all variations of sketching out dishes and deciding how you want things presented or where you want to place things or how colors play off of one another by chefs in their either their notebooks or sketchbooks. And kind of the quality or the granularity by which you do these drawings can vary depending on the person. And this is like how much time they have, their level of skill as like a drawer or sketcher person. I like I have my friend Shota Nakajima who has like tomes of sketchbooks of him sketching out dishes for his restaurants. And then you that, that that kind of more aligns with what you're seeing on screen right now with Carmen. And then you also have chefs who like will literally take a sea fold or a paper paper towel and just a sharpie and just say, here's the plate, here's the piece of fish, here's the piece of fennel, here's the sauce, and we're gonna sprinkle this on top. And then that can just convey an idea before you actually have all the ingredients prepped, or it helps someone kind of like understand what it is that you're thinking because auditorily describing that doesn't always get the point across. I think I kind of pushed back on doing this for a while because I was like, well, I can just do a demo plate up or like. Like, I don't want to have to have a bunch of like colored pencils or pens or like I, I'm honestly not that good of a drawer. But then I ultimately got to a point where like I loved the Apple Pencil combined with an iPad and the Procreate app because I would draw dish ideas and then I would include those in kind of like the digital logistics management system that I would do when I was doing pop-up dinners because oftentimes the people that I would hire to help me on those pop-up dinners were working with me sometimes either for the first time or for the first time in a long time and then ultimately being able, being able to say, hey, I know you have no idea what it is this dish that we're doing tonight is but this is how I plan on having it look and then they can review that before they come to the pop-up dinner and that helped me so much and that kind of plays off of the like eating to learn aspect of once you get to a certain point of your chef career you can sketch something out and you can look at it on the sketch and you can say yeah it's missing an herb or yeah like there's no absolutely no height to this dish what is going on with that if you kind of geek out on this stuff or you want to improve your plating or get some insights into how I think about different plating aesthetics and the different categories and genres of it all I have a free video down below it's on the second channel channel where you can go ahead and get some insights there. Are we drawing? Are we doing drawings now? Well, no, I just, I had to draw these because we didn't have the heat, so I couldn't You had you. to draw them, so then you, like, whip out these fucking Sistine Chapel. Like, this yeah. is, there's, like, shading here. Right, okay, just listen. So, uh, I, I was thinking we'd do the uh, frozen grapes in a bowl okay. standalone, right? And then... We'd pour the broth over hot. Yes, table exactly. Side. And then I, I did, nice. I had this other thought that I'm... So, conceptually, they're not far off from the sense that, like, the, the Heston Blumenthal dish of doing hot and cold tea served out of the same cup, and you have both sensations happening on your palate at the same time. Every modernist chef has played with temperature in some way, shape, or form. But in the preparation they're talking about, and this is one guy's opinion here, the frozen grapes almost work like ice cubes, right? And then you have this hot broth, and you're going to pour the hot broth over these cold ice cubes. And what's going to happen? You're either going to need to instruct the guest to, like, eat this really quickly, otherwise it's going to be, like, just a lukewarm bowl of broth and grapes at the end, or that's just what the guest is going to unfortunately have to experience, because, like, entropy is just a thing. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is like the red flag I see is like this being its own composed dish. I, can, I think absolutely if this was like a little shooter and you had the grapes in a spoon and the spoon was frozen and then the broth was hot and then maybe you instruct the guest to like take this grapes and put it in the shooter and then drink it all at the same time and you make sure that the temperature's right so you're not burning anybody's throat. But again, all variables that you need to be cognizant of because in these types of executions where you're playing with temperature and especially drastic changes in temperature, if it's not quite on the mark, it just falls completely flat on its face and it ends up being a massive disappointment. And so many chefs are willing to take the risk because on the other side, when you can nail it and it's something no one's ever had before and the flavors work and the temperature is just like a wow sensation, I've never had that before, it can really be memorable. So I'm not trying to blame them for going into this arena, but I just, I, I hear them talking about this dish and that's just like red flags, red flags. This, um, <laughs> Why do they do this to me every single season? It's almost like bait. It's it's just in bait on these episodes. This is even cleaner for me to see that there's like a blade right here. And someone absolutely tore the tape coming off of this tape dispenser. But having the scissors right there, it's like the reason that you have the tape, tape on a dispenser is so that you can actually just not take the scissors out of the equation. All you have to do is take the size of strip that you want and just have a clean cut that goes on it. And then it's reset that somebody else can come along and use the dispenser the way that the dispenser is supposed to be used. And I can already hear somebody in the comments, Justin, the way that the tape comes off of the dispenser, it still has these little jagged lines on it. It's like, then don't use the dispenser. There is a 100% increase in the number of hands that you need to use going from one hand 
tape dispenser. The tape is cut. It's a clean line. It's not ripped or torn. It's not irregular. Compared to tape in one hand and you're using the other hand to stretch the tape out, then you need to grab another hand to grab the scissors. It is just a completely different process. The little marginal benefit that exists by like having the where the tape starts because of the dispenser being there, it's like it doesn't do it for me. It does, however, speak to the little like nitty gritty internalized details of like so many characters in this episode that they pick up on and just making sure that like everybody has this culture of like, oh, that that, that looks kind of off or like that's not quite right or like, I'm hang on, I just need to go over and fix that. Uh, this looks kind of like a chaos menu. Well, no, it's like it's a thoughtful chaos menu. Hmm. Look, Claire and I, we, we were talking about it last night and, and she helped me realize that maybe I was clinging on to some things that I don't know, maybe I just I, I don't care that much about anymore. Right. And this is good, right? Because this, this is what you wanted. Uh, yeah, it is. Yeah. Right. Um, I mean, just ask yourself, why did Sydney go to the restaurants that she went to in the episode where she went to go out to eat? Was it because the menus and the philosophy had this kind of like trauma processing slash narrative kind of approach? Or was it just because the food was banging and the hospitality experience was really like comforting and satisfying and elevated? It goes back to this idea that I talked about with my friend Max Shapiro on the podcast called Chef Driven Dining versus Guest Driven Dining. I have that clip linked up in the description down below. But I keep coming back to this idea and I had to break down this wall for myself because I was this person. When I started writing menus on my own, I was like, well, it has to have like this part of it that I have to like drop the detail halfway through the dish or when I'm presenting this table side to the guest, I need to tell them about this detail and that's going to like shoot them over the moon. And I think ultimately it's this like compensatory thing that you do when you're insecure because what you basically want is if, in a sense, if the guest has the dish and they say, well, I, I didn't really understand the flavors there or that wasn't quite delicious, you could say, ah, ha, ha, but wait, and then you pull the story out of your hat and you say, yeah, but look at this. Look at this story that I presented this with. And that will like make up for the fact that your cooking is not quite up to snuff or you had too many components or the flavors didn't quite meld with one another or something from an execution perspective wasn't quite right or the flavor of this was wrong because of the way that you treated it. And that idea that I keep coming back to is food is not a story. And you can do this for yourself. Just pick a dish, pick maybe like a restaurant that comes to mind. And the first time that you sat at that table, if you were served what you were served, would you be able to tell the story had someone not presented the story along with the food? Would the food have done the story justice? The answer for me in most cases is no. You can present historical facts and sense of place and the way that individuals kind of contributed into an idea as you're presenting a dish. That is totally, I'm not saying we don't do that, but the food itself and most importantly, the act of enjoying it, the actual gastronomic senses that are going off and firing in both your olfactory system and your taste buds and digestion, all of that is not a story. In a lot of ways, that's a hedonic experience. It's incredibly personal. Maybe said another way, like the story doesn't actually make the food taste any better. It might make you appreciate it in a different way. It might give you some more insights into like, I have this context now of why they're using like these spices or why they decided to prepare the protein in this way. But I just, I'm saying it to this audience just because I know a lot of you folks write your own menus. And I know it can often get like in the world of chef's table episodes where they sit the food critic down in the dining room and they have the person talking about the stuff and the chef's walking in slow motion. It's like, oh, well, I need to do that. I need to have a story. Not understanding the fact that, like, if it's going to cover up for poor cooking or if it's going to actually masquerade as good cuisine, that is actually just such a recipe, pardon the pun, for disaster. Maybe we can put this to bed by riddling me this. What chef, after 20 years being open, is putting forth a narrative menu like this? It's usually that chef's first menu or it's a part of their pop-up or it's like once the documentary starts getting filmed, then they actually switch and they start getting so narrative with the way that they're putting things together. And to me, it doesn't help the team. Like if Carmen was going to be the one on the station making the cannolis every single night and he could imbue all of that kind of like personal, personal touch and the way that he cares about this dish into it every single night, then yeah, totally like run forward with that narrative approach. But what I find so often is like chefs will have this narrative that is either tied to their childhood, their previous experience. And then what happens? They delegate it to somebody else who doesn't have the context, who doesn't have that personal connection to the thing and then they get upset that they don't care about it as much as them the one that came up with the idea and don't get me wrong there absolutely is a time and a place to tell your story to make people aware of your background to make sure that you're giving context on why it is you do that what you do but in my experience and i'm more than open to having one of you folks change my mind down low in the comments 
it does more harm than good when we roll forward with this, like, I'm putting myself on a plate Ness as a chef. She's got seven years. Elska, Oriol, Smith. Yeah, that's a lot of moving around for seven years, and that's not why we can't hire her. Napkin would have driven me fucking crazy, and I would have fixed it. They didn't technically say what role they were hiring her for. If it was more of like a general manager role, maybe, then I can kind of see why they were talking about her like seven years across three places being bad. But in all reality, like that's actually not that far off from what you'll often see in the industry. It's like you stay for a year, you sometimes stay for two years, maybe max three years until you like either get promoted into a management position or then you start to stagnate and you're starting to think about either moving or your visa is up and you need to go back home. But like that's not all that weird from the rest restaurant perspective, yeah, they're great restaurants. We talked about Elska. We saw that in Dave Posey's restaurant that Sydney was doing R&D at. We talked about Oriel. The episode that I did with Jeannie Kwan was in the dining room of Oriel at that restaurant. I have a TPC episode of my meal there. And then Smith is Chef John Shields and his wife Karen's restaurant, also in Chicago. They went from two Michelin stars to three Michelin stars since this show came out, which is an awesome achievement. I guess I bring this up because I think a lot about this idea of, like, tenure guilt in the industry. And, like, if you across seven years, you've worked at three places it's like I don't want you to think that if you're watching this and you're working in the industry that that's like a scarlet letter or that's a bad thing does it signal something if you're able to stay at a place for an extended period of time it absolutely does and the little interview test thing that Richie did with the napkin and the fork I've never actually gotten hired on the front of house side I've always been on the culinary side in previous episodes I've talked about some of the hiring tests whether it's making a dish or like how you set up your station that chefs will test you on but like if there's anybody who works front of house or hires on the front of house side who does tests like this I would love to know in the comments if that's something that you've either had success with or you just happen to do it on every single interview candidate. Shiny new pans. Tina's loving it. Fire suppression. It's like any time an inspector comes, right? Four. It's that quote I said early on. Everyone's fighting a battle you know nothing about. Keep going. Three. They show it across everyone. This is kind of super inside baseball, but there actually are a couple of reasons why these place settings look the way that they look. And I know that Richie is kind of like just trying to play out what a typical guest might look like and just to triple check and make sure that like the sizes of things are right and how we want things to be laid out because he's probably going to be writing a service manual that's going to include like where the water glass goes and the ways that the knives face and all of those sorts of details. But based on the way that the table is set, it actually does send a like more visual message to like the greater service team. And and it's another one of those unspoken communication pieces where like if a table is reset by somebody and it's ready for the next two top to sit down, it might have the napkin and the fork and the knife and then that little appetizer plate right on the place setting. Compared to a completely empty table that might need to still be wiped down and you need to check to make sure nobody left their purse there or any of those other little details. And usually what dictates what the place setting is, is usually just kind of an amalgamation of like the most average order that most people are making as they come into the restaurant. Or if it's a tasting menu spot, and you know that everybody's going to start with this particular dish, then it's very easy to decide, okay, what's the initial place setting going to look like? And the other kind of like old school restaurateur detail is the wine glass on the table, which you will often see as just kind of like a just primer mentally for the guest to be thinking about like, oh yeah, maybe I should have a glass of wine. Does that work in 2024? I don't know. I haven't seen a recent study on that in ages, but that was like a consumer psychology just piece that people realize that if you put a glass of wine down on the table, even if it's empty, it is more likely that people when presented with the wine list will say yeah maybe I should have a glass of wine because the glass is already here kind of thing it's like subliminally influencing your decision making that's it for me for episode 8 I am looking forward to seeing all of you folks back for episode 9 don't forget to hit subscribe and like on this video if you enjoyed these breakdowns my name is Justin Kana thanks so much as always for your attention and I hope you have a good one man that's some good looking bolognese